would like to, to thank everyone for being here today and taking part in this panel. In this panel, we have uh, only three papers, um, not four. Uh, for logistical reasons, the first paper on ontologies uh, was moved to another panel yesterday. Thus, uh, the first paper is on uh, ontologies and uh, another two uh, on shape grammars. As a customary, the discussion will take place at the end of the three papers. And as you know, uh, uh, we are very late. <laughs> so I ask the speakers to try to respect the, the times. Uh, the first paper is presented by Rui de Klerk, having as a co-author José Nuno Beiran, and his title is uh, All Bottles from One Design Semantics in Design Generation Using Ontologies to Control Shape Generation. The paper gives an example uh, of a design uh, system where some simple shape grammars operating on an um, ontology, describing a design domain, generates all possible and valid instance allow in that uh, domain. Uh, the design domain choosing bottle design where only the bottle shape is considered. Uh, Rui de Klerk and uh, José Nuno Beiran both uh, come from the Faculty of Architecture of the University of Lisbon and belong to Research Center of Architecture, Urbanism and Design. Uh, please, if you... Okay. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for, for being here. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, semantics and uh, the relationship between uh, ontologies and, uh, and uh, design systems using uh, shape grammars. So our goal <coughs> is to create multi-purpose semantic design systems, which can be applied to architecture, urbanism, of, or design. Uh, and in this case, you're going to focus on the domain of design. So semantic design systems, how do we, how do we see what it is? This, how do we, do we uh, conceptualize it? Uh, so it's a design system that has a generative system, in our case, using uh, uh, compound shape grammars that is paired with, with knowledge bases, with ontologies. And uh, with these uh, two brought together, we can introduce semantic accuracy in the, in the designs and design evaluation during the design process. Grobler and all uh, recognize this, uh, this uh, symbiosis between uh, shape grammars and ontologies uh, because they, they share uh, similarities between themselves. Uh, and uh, one, of the, one of the beauties of uh, shape grammars and ontologies is that they, they make uh, design knowledge explicit. And this is one of the, the things uh, that, that is very, very appealing and that allows us to move into a different type of design systems. So, Rudy already gave us a, a, a very good introduction yesterday on uh, shape grammars. I'm going to try and, and <laughs> live up to it. Uh, but we basically have uh, shape rules, like these two very simple shape rules. Each rule has a predicate and a consequent shape. So, starting with an initial shape, like, uh, like this, uh, this one, what we do is find the, the predicate in the shape rule, its equivalent transformation in the, in the initial shape, and then just subtract it from the initial shape and replace it with the consequent shape, with the equivalent transformation of the consequent shape. <clears throat> then we can apply this iteratively over time using different rules and achieving different designs that can increase in complexity very easily with the very simple rules. So, on the side of ontologies, uh, Gruber defined ontologies as, and for me this is one of the best uh, syntheses of it, as an explicit specification of a conceptualization. So this is very <laughs> three very important words, specific specification of a conceptualization. In our case, we're using uh, the, w the World Wide Web Consortium Standard, which is a ontology web, langu web ontology language too, and semantic web technologies to, to work with ontologies. So ontologies are very well suited for well-known and well-defined uh, well types. In, this, in our case, we are looking at design types. 
Uh, they may contain different types of information. It can be physical, formal, uh, conceptual, um, and relate with different uh, ontologies as well that define the same concepts. Uh, and one of the beauties of this is that the ontologies, ontology definition is a collaborative and adaptive process that changes over time into hopefully a better and uh, more accurate definition about uh, subjects. One of the things that is also very interesting is that we can have different ontologies to define the same concepts, um, which allows us to have different points of view regarding the same the subject. So in case of all, all ontologies consist of classes, individuals, and properties. Classes set and are sets that contain individuals into a taxonomic structure with some assumption uh, relationships. Individuals are, are objects in the domain of interest that belong to those classes. And uh, considering the world, uh, open world assumption that uh, anyone can say anything about any topic, uh, different entities, entities with different names can, relate, can be defining the same concept. And properties are binary relations on individuals and on, in a, with individuals and data. Uh, with uh, some properties, like functional property when we only have one. So the building blocks of ontologies are subjects that relate to objects via a predicate. So these triples that uh, are defined with URIs that allows us to uh, make them unique uh, towards the world. So how can we put the two of them together? Um, so regarding the shape rule, if we consider the predicate, we can define the predicate in an ontology. So if we see the, the example above, we had the, the previous example, we had a triangle. And we can say that the triangle has, uh, is con is, um, consists of uh, three lines, that, that L0, L1, and L, L, uh, L1, L0, L1, L2, and L3 that are lines, are of the concept line that have starting and end points, which I don't need to specify that there are points because if we define that lines have a starting point and an end point, uh, those are already uh, considered points. And then the predicates of the, of, the, of the rule can become the same part of the ontology that we want to keep and add new information to it that relates to the previous concept or not, or creates new concepts. So by restructuring the, uh, with the parameters as well, I'm sorry. So if we can restructure the, or redefine uh, a rule in a compound shape grammar, having a part that is a shape representation and an ontological representation, which in fact informs the shape representation and can uh, hold the, the, the completely the representation of the shape in different formats. So in our case, what we are building towards this uh, semantic the design system is working with, uh, on the semantic side with frameworks that are based on RDF and AL, which are semantic web uh, uh, standards that uh, can be edited either with Protege or in our case, we are using already two, which is a, a Python API for ontology oriented programming, which allows us to, to relate, to combine um, ontologies with Python classes and mix them all together, which is quite, uh, quite powerful. Uh, and regarding the design systems, uh, we are working with some compound shape grammars that, are, that consist of very simple and basic shapes and generic rules. And uh, the, the tools that we are using now are uh, Rhinoceros 5 with the Grasshopper 3D and this little component that allows us to run a Python 3 code within Grasshopper that has some bugs, but uh, overall it works rather well. And when we combine this using ontology-oriented programming, uh, we can achieve uh, semantic design systems in a, uh, quite uh, an interactive way. But in the future, what we would like to do is uh, generalize this part and uh, also introduce Oracle GI in the, in the as part of the design system mechanism that can increase the, the, 
the, the range and the, the scope of, uh, of our semantic design systems. So the provocation, all bottles from one design. Uh, how can we define the concept of a bottle? Uh, we have so many different types of bottles, ranging from materiality to the, the type of beverage that they have, uh, sizes, uh, um, that, that is really hard to take a look at one bottle and say, okay, this is it. This is the concept that defines them all. So we need to find a way to to, to synthesize the, this information. Uh, dictionaries are not very helpful because they, they, they're very simplistic and when it comes to defining bottles. They, they basically say it's a, a, like confined with space that is larger and that has a, a narrow, narrower space. Uh, so we can try and define bottles via an anatomic description, either the fabrication process, materiality, purpose, etc. And we found that what seems to be the, in our case, in, in our approach, the best way to define it would be through anatomic description. So, and again, then we need to see what kind of descriptions we can have for, uh, for bottles. So, but we can see and try to find where they, they might agree between, uh, between themselves. And we can see that most of them have partitioned the anatomy of the bottle in, uh, in the same places using similar concepts. And other, other uh, approaches to it, some more defined than others. There are, there are others that include a lot of descriptions uh, without actually stating the, the names. Okay. But we can see that they almost all agree upon the, the parts of it. <clears throat> when, and regarding the design of bottles, then we have the shape representation that we need to break down into these uh, anatomic parts and uh, matching one anatomic part to, to a, a shape representation, which is parametric. So in, uh, in October, we had uh, uh, a small workshop where we tried to put designers working with ontologies and uh, creating ontologies in Protege. And uh, after the session, at the end of the session, we said, okay, now that you learned how to, how to create simple ontologies in, uh, in Protege, Let's try and define the concept of bottles. And this is a little bit of uh, what was agreed upon after the session. So considering a bottle anatomy, uh, that all bottles would have a bottle base, a bottle uh, body, that in this case would also have a bottle label that you decide to put aside instead of being uh, explicitly a part of the bottle base because the label can be somewhere else as well. Bottle shoulders, bottle neck, and bottle finish. And then considering, for instance, the, the wine, beer, and, and, and also other uh, beverages, the, the, the base of the bottle would have different, uh, different uh, shapes for, regarding its function, as well as the shoulders or the, the body. Now, to have a representation of bottles, uh, if you want to go uh, the, the ontological way, we also need uh, an ontology to describe geometries, so we can relate them in a, in a consistent way and adaptive way. Uh, there are some ontologies that have been created over time regarding geometry. Uh, we decided to redesign uh, one of them uh, using uh, rhino Coleman uh, um, syntax, so we can then just uh, export the the representations in Rhino Common to, to Rhino and uh, have it generate the shape. So how can we pair uh, the concepts with parametric shape representation? So if we have a bottle part, we just say that it has a representation that is a geometric representation. The bottle part belonging to the, the bottle ontology and the representation to the geometry ontology. So in the case of uh, designing a bottle of wine, we can start with uh, saying that uh, it's going to be uh, uh, an aged red wine that is going to cause sediments. And if it has sediments, then it should have a, a bottle punt. 
uh, to, to where they can rest over time. So we would start with a, uh, a bottle punt with a parametric representation that we can see there. Then we would go to the bottle bottle, the, the body that relates to the, the bottle punt. Then the shoulder that needs to be accentuated because the wine causes sediments over time. The neck and the finish. All of this put together give us a section of the, of the, the bottle of wine which can be then translated into a 3D shape representation. And these for different types of, of bottles with different properties. So future work. Uh, one of the things that we need to do is to consolidate this design system because right now it's, uh, it's almost like a Frankenstein that is being uh, put together and needs to be consolidated and fine-tuned. Uh, with a proper interface. Uh, combine design patterns better with semantics. For instance, this example that I gave of the, the aged wine, red wine that caused sediments. If it caused sediments, then it needs a punt. You cannot just have a push up in the base because, or the shape of the bottle cannot be very um, fluid. It needs to contain the wine as much as possible when we move the bottle. Otherwise, the sediments will mix with the wine again. And this can be embedded in the design process, not just uh, something that we need to remember. Oh, maybe I shouldn't draw, design the bottle this way because there are some properties that uh, the bottle needs to meet. Uh, extend the bottle representations to, to new types, uh, which is rather challenging when, we, when it comes to, specifically when it comes to um, spirits, because uh, the tendency in uh, spirit bottles is to be completely out of the norm, most of them. Uh, but uh, they, they still hold the same concepts that uh, we found in the bottle of anatomy. So they can be mapped and, uh, and represented in a, in a semantic design system. Extend, extend and enrich the, both ontologies, the bottle ontology and the, the geometry ontology, and apply the methodology to other design domains in design. Uh, this work comes from uh, uh, when we started uh, the previous work, uh, we, did, we targeted the, the domain of urbanism with a, a, a design system for uh, street cross sections that has the, the same concepts underlying. And uh, now this brought us to, to design, uh, which has a, an easier way to, to deal with concepts than uh, the urban ontology. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your attention. The second paper is presented by Pedro Angel uh, and uh, is titled uh, Supergrid, a grammar for a kit of part pedagogy. About the theme of this paper, Supergrid is the product of an ongoing research project linked to a first year design studio in the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, which employs kit of parts exercise, a didactic uh, method share some key principles with the realm of uh, generative grammars, since both uh, really unlimited universes of elements and a set of combination <coughs> rules. The goals of these papers uh, uh, paper are uh, twofold. Hmm? Uh, on one end, uh, it's aimed to describing the process of development of the supergrid so far. On the other hand, is inten <coughs> it intends uh, to outline specific topics for the further development of the algorithms, um, which will especially uh, set out direction in terms of resources and com computational technology to be brought in the research in its uh, next uh, phases. Pedro Angel comes from the Faculty of Architecture of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and belongs to laboratory of uh, models and theory, teaching and methodology of the urban project. He is a professor in the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, dedicated to first year's studios in the Department of Analysis of Representation of Form. Please, Pedro. Hi. Good morning. Um, well, uh, the supergrid is um, design of an algorithm um, 
aimed at producing uh, physical and digital models to aid uh, a design studio, uh, specifically forming a catalog of um, architectural situations uh, which can be demonstrated to, to the students in order to understand um, compositional and architectural uh, fundamental issues. Um, <clears throat> the design studio uh, uses uh, the kit of parts pedagogy. It's a um, didactic strategy well known uh, and notably um, celebrated for uh, its use <clears throat> in uh, first year design studios. Uh, it's basically based on a set of uh, a limited set of elements and a few combination rules that could be uh, more or less strict. And its advantage, the, the advantage of this kind of, of uh, design exercise is to allow a first year stu student, uh, one who is not very familiar with the design uh, process, to enter in the experimentation process and through it, understand both um, synthetic uh, reasoning and know the, the elements of architecture of a certain language, we could say, uh, but also to gain criteria and understanding of uh, architectural fundamental issues. Uh, these are all um, exercises from the 1950s on uh, Texas uh, University. Um, in Austin, <clears throat> developed by John Hayduk. And this is a, a further um, development of this kind of ex exercise in Cooper Union along the 70s. Um, we, <clears throat> in the Federal University of, uh, of Rio, have uh, um, adopted this kind of didactic, didactic uh, strategy in order to uh, pose some fundamental questions about the architectural space. Uh, for first year students. Uh, the agenda of, of our studio um, uh, has a few uh, guidelines. One of them is understanding the, mul uh, the multiple uh, semantic uh, uh, senses of, uh, of architectural form and situations. So a pillar or a wall here is not just um, uh, a plane that uh, either sustains the building or limits the space, it's also a visual um, uh, element, it's also uh, a load-bearing element uh, in terms of uh, the pillar, and it, it's, um, uh, it interferes in, in use and so on. Uh, other part of the agenda is to allow students to, to employ uh, syntactic reasoning uh, as a sort of uh, um, computation without computers, understanding modular systems and, and uh, dimensioning variations, and uh, <clears throat> applying those, um, this reasoning to very simple design problems. Nowadays, we have been uh, uh, working with limited lots, uh, straight, uh, sorry, narrow lots, uh, with the issues of uh, subtractions in order to bring light inside, and the interface between internal space and the street uh, as a, uh, a locus of uh, fundamental uh, architectural problems. Hence, the facade uh, has been a, a place where we discuss the, um, the problem of spatial interface and, and its probable uh, probable consequences in terms of uh, use and construction of, uh, of, of, of the street. <clears throat> uh, these exercises in the studio, uh, they um, are used to, to, to gain a language, to, to, to learn crafts as well, and to pose uh, um, fundamental questions. And it goes on <clears throat> onto a more complex architectural questions where uh, uh, a more complex architectural problem, where it develops into uh, uh, a real site, uh, and this is the closing exercise of the of the of the year. Well, um, 
one of the, um, the, the issues uh, posed when you use a kit of parts uh, exercise that you have to have a limited um, uh, architecture language. Uh, we have, uh, for didactic reasons, um, focused on um, uh, r rational architecture of the early 19th, uh, 19th, uh, 20th century, but also with the Brazilian counterpart that adapts to, to climate and uses um, the facade as a, a more wider buffer zone between inside and outside with all the shading elements and also uh, it's reached to verna vernacular uh, architecture. Uh, <clears throat> this, of course, has a relationship with the sprawl that is seen around uh, Brazilian periphery. And we have realized that the, the basic elements of modern architecture uh, in its more erudite uh, uh, versions have also spread onto uh, the architecture or the construction without architects that is pervasive uh, along the urban peripheries in Brazil. Since most of our students also come from this place, uh, places like these, uh, we also understand that it, this is a way to make uh, uh, design intelligence um, <clears throat> uh, be promoted over um, uh, 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 resources that are not necessarily available in the most areas of the country. Um, so we have both um, allowed for a very simple uh, um, use of the, the, the kit of parts uh, language, but also deviations from its first, uh, from its very basic um, um, instances. Well, inside the studio, it has been uh, clear for years that to have uh, a proper collection of the architectural forms that we use uh, within the kit of parts and within the universe of references, um, we have realized that having this uh, kind of collection of, of, of examples has been a very fruitful um, didactic uh, aid. So, uh, after some time, we began to collect uh, the, better, uh, the best works of previous students in order to, to show examples of syntactic variations and uh, specific relationships between closing and structure, um, which the kit of parts allowed. Hence, the, um, the idea of the supergrid became, um, uh, 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 came to us when uh, looking at this big collection of models, we realized that maybe uh, a computing system would, be, would allow us to produce uh, a large quantity of models or either uh, one big model uh, of uh, containing, just as a catalog, um, a large number of variations uh, uh, possible within the kit of parts uh, used in the studio. So, <clears throat> uh, we began maybe four um, months ago to develop this uh, grasshopper algorithm uh, in which uh, we produce both uh, a digi digital model uh, where uh, by controlling uh, a set of variables we can play with different parts of the, um, of the architecture and simultaneously um, creating the line drawings for the physical model. Uh, so the objective here is to uh, produce like uh, a big, uh, a large quantity of this, uh, this sort of uh, catalog of, of situations. Uh, of course, the idea of, of the, the kit of parts um, being understood into as a grammar uh, is what, le what led to, to this uh, construction of, of the algorithm. Uh, but in order to, to formalize it uh, computationally, 
we needed first to, to devise what, what would be the, the, the actual parts of, the, of our, of our uh, system. So <clears throat> we implemented kind of what we call a loose analytical grammar, uh, parting from the actual uh, exercises uh, done in different uh, semesters. Of course, they variate along, along uh, the years. Uh, but also adopting um, a simple language for structure, which uh, is composed of pillars, beams, and slabs. There is no flat uh, or, or beamless slab. Uh, this mainly because civil construction in Brazil still uses uh, mostly uh, beams. Uh, we implement. We also found uh, some basic. Uh, um, lines onto to the closure of uh, facade in modern, build, modern buildings. So waistline, um, the top of, of, of uh, windows, and then the limits of, uh, uh, of the closings being <coughs> the beams on bottom and top. And <coughs> went on into analyzing a few uh, modern examples to, to gain the language or, or the elements for uh, the facade closures, and also the relationship between closing elements and uh, structure. So <clears throat> from there, we, we devised uh, a series of um, uh, cat categories for the elements. The first uh, big category being the structure, um, composed of pillars, beams, and slabs. Then the closing systems, composed of walls or opaque walls, transparent and translucent glass, uh, perforated walls, which in Brazil um, is a system known as cobogó, uh, uh, basically a, a, a perforated brick, uh, which allows for wind to, to, to pass through. Uh, the parapet, parapets as limits for uh, balconies, and of course, uh, the absence of any closing system as a possible solution, either for pilotees or uh, terraces. And then a uh, third kind of category, which are the external prot protections for, uh, usually for sun. So all kinds of panels, moving uh, panels. Uh, shading planes, uh, like a small uh, horizontal or vertical slabs perpendicular to the facades. And, and filters, uh, which, um, um, we can mention the brisolet, which is uh, present in our um, Brazilian architectural language, uh, and, and possibly uh, different uh, kinds of, of, of filters. Like, um, and of course, <coughs> there's a space open for more elements, uh, either re regarding to relationship to, to, to the ground, um, which can be added on, uh, further on to the, to the, um, to the uh, supergrid. <clears throat> and, well, the, the elements of structure, I'll detail this, this part a little more so we can understand the possible variations contained in the grid, uh, made of pillars, beams, and slabs, but then, um, the idea is to allow for a uh, little movement in, onto the facade. So uh, we started with uh, six types of, um, of relationships between beams uh, and pillars uh, and slabs, uh, which allows for this sort of variation. Uh, this means that uh, the system doesn't uh, allow for all kinds of, of, um, of stretching and variations, but usually only the segments of structure, um, of the structure um, are, are, are subject to, to choice and variation. So <clears throat> they've been a little recessed, a little in front, and then of course also the um, the thickness of the pillar perpendicular to the facade. Now, this was basically the language that we started to use. Um, 
and allows uh, for plays that um, uh, may form this kind of, of, of complexity in terms of form. Uh, uh, of course, in terms of the, the, um, um, the closing planes as well, we have 80, uh, 28 designs based on this uh, small grid, which can be chosen uh, by the designer. Uh, and then the, uh, the openings uh, where the black part is can be filled by either plain, uh, glass or um, cobogos or, um, or, or be let open. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, of course, uh, also um, uh, a set of possibilities in terms of closing planes and so on. I, don't, I will not go into these parts. Um, well, uh, the, this block was devised as the unit for, for the model. Uh, on the front part, it has all the closings, and on the back part, we let the structure be uh, still uh, uh, naked. Uh, if you look closely, of course, you see larger pillars on, on um, uh, higher pav pavements. It's, it's not still uh, uh, well, well devised. We uh, have to, to get this um, structure logic uh, straight still. Uh, this is the, the, the idea of, of setting up the catalog. So we can understand the structure in terms of its, its, its skeleton. And then on the other side, to understand uh, what role the closing system, the closing planes uh, play in the construction of the facade. Um, <clears throat> well, one great issue was to design the physical model because of, of course, um, being a physical model uh, poses some technical questions. So we realized uh, we needed um, to, to, we were uh, limited by uh, um, uh, our resources. Uh, one key issue here was to, to use the MDF of three millimeters, which is 15 centimeters in uh, one to 50 scale. And, and of course, using as less glue as possible uh, privileging uh, snapping and fitting for a fast assembly of the model. So we devised uh, an actual uh, um, a set of elements for the physical model, uh, which allows for this faster assembly. So from a beam, uh, ground beam put on that position, we have, uh, uh, we, we um, snap the, uh, um, the ribs, which are elements that contain both uh, pillars and perpendicular uh, beams, beams that are perpendicular to the facade, <clears throat> and complete with um, inner beams. And then the facade beams, which are segmented according to the variations uh, proposed by the, um, the algorithm. Um, they're put later, then the slabs, which are, um, enclosed by the, the facade beams. We cannot see the slabs from the facade. And then um, the closing planes as well are, are added. And then so on with the glasses. And, and well, the, one of the issues to, to, to uh, design within the supergrid was the problem of uh, connecting uh, um, the, the elements of the structure. So we, <clears throat> we started to use uh, slots and protrusions to, to allow for a fitting. And this uh, organized into this 15 by 15 centimeters grid uh, allowed for the, the, um, the MDF be used in, on both uh, um, um, uh, uh, the three possible directions in terms of the, the Cartesian grid that uh, organizes the structure. So here we have an example of um, the fitting uh, system devised in the physical model. Yeah, with the slabs um, outside um, being enclosed by the, the facade beams. 
in terms of the, 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 the whole um, structure, this grid, structural grid is uh, partially parametric. We can move on distances and, and also adjust the size of the basic module. Uh, <clears throat> and the variations are being controlled in Get Grasshopper through uh, this, what I call a kind of a control room. This is one of the issues that needs to, to have improvement. The interface is still very, uh, still complicated. Um, Oh, and uh, we had to develop uh, uh, kind of simple conditional coding to, to allow for uh, the slots and the protrusions in different elements to, to meet the conditions found in each node of the structure. So, for example, if we find that on this particular node, uh, there's a recessed beam on one side and a balcony on the other. Uh, this is going to uh, produce a combination of, of designs for the, the joints, which is uh, specific. So we ended up with different, uh, 28 different designs for the, the ribs and 19 different designs for uh, the meeting of, of uh, the beams, where the facade beams meet the ribs. Uh, this was done by simple um, uh, Python uh, uh, code. Uh, and this is the conditional coding that we, we found, uh, we developed. Uh, one, one, as I mentioned, the selection is still to have, uh, oh, one minute, okay. It's still to be, to be well developed in terms of the interface. Uh, and one of the big issues that uh, has uh, appeared to us as a, the further development of the algorithm is to design well the selection system to be used uh, in the in the construction of the um, of the supergrid. Oh. Uh, okay, I'll I'll leave it at this. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> okay. The third paper of this panel is presented by Daniel Lenz and is titled a Generative System Using Shape Grammar, a Case Study Visual Programming. About uh, the theme of this paper aims to describe techniques and the results of a workshop for finding and generative systems, which uh, took place at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro related to generative systems and a translation and application of the, to the architectural project. Daniel Lenz comes from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. He is an architect and urbanist by Federal University of uh, Ceará uh, and PhD candidate at graduate program in urbanism of uh, the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, hopefully, I will not be very long. And let's see how we can do and get this um, well explained. Um, like I was, uh, it was said yesterday by Gonzalo, we had a workshop in, in UFRJ last year. And uh, it was a study about uh, generative systems. and trying to see some techniques, how far they can go, and how could we uh, implement them uh, using Grasshopper. And uh, it was divided in uh, four categories. Uh, we studied shape grammar, uh, L systems, automata cellular, and uh, genetic uh, algorithm. And it, I ended up with uh, shape grammars, mostly because of my work during the masters with Gabriela Silani and things like that. Anyway, so um, the first problem that we have here is how to define exactly what is a generative system. And it's not exactly very uh, uh, definitive. Uh, the boundaries are much loose and we Sometimes we think that one, one kind of method can be a generative system, the other is not. And this was much of our, uh, of our concernings. And uh, 
Uh, but still, one thing is very clear. You have to establish which are the steps uh, to use during a certain uh, procedure. And how does they go and how to implement this is uh, further consideration. So um, the problem, uh, again, is if I say to someone, to a computer, that uh, doesn't have much knowledge, just, just work with very simple commands, go and draw this, he will not know how to do it and have to explain it very, very, very well and get every step uh, very briefly depending on the capacity of it. It may be a computer, uh, a personal computer, for instance, or it may be as well, be a student. If you go to tell him to, to draw a facade, you have to tell him first how to do it. I have to explain it very uh, clearly. Uh, sometimes when this uh, computer gets more experience, you can just say, uh, draw a house, and it works very well. It's no problem at all. Well, so uh, for the workshop we decided uh, we wanted to uh, build our own implementation, com uh, com computational implementation of uh, the shape grammar. And then we went back um, to study a little more of uh, the first definitions by Steiner and Gibbs. And uh, we could track its, uh, uh, its origins to, to uh, Chomsk's uh, generative grammars, which is, works pretty much like um, there comes an idea to a person, and then it's inherent to, to each of us a structure of how it will become a sentence. And then we start to search for some words uh, to fill the slots of this structure and replace that uh, originally blank one by uh, something that uh, has a meaning. And what we understand that was uh, translated to shape grammars was this idea uh, of replacement of some slots or something like that. So, uh, and reading further, uh, we started to see that all the time we talk about a vocabulary, some shapes that you use. We talk about always about the rules. And uh, it can, kind of gets automatic or not talked about that uh, there'll be some sequence of how the rules will be applied to each shapes, but it's not exactly uh, very explicit. And this is one of the things that uh, we understood should be uh, more well addressed to explicit each step that we are doing. So uh, the grammar was added to, to organize it in this triple ordinate, have a set for the, the shapes, have a set for the rules, and then a set for, uh, that will describe the sequence of applying the rules. So the grammar will be the relating of all these sets and then we have to fi figure a way to computationally um, co concatenate those. So it gets easier because I just have to work with uh, just these three sets. And if I assemble uh, a mechanism that then can take this, uh, the first element here, the second element here, and the other one that says who works with, who works with whom, then it's all, all, all done, so easier to work. So, uh, I'll have to sit here for a <laughs> uh, What we devised then for the, for the definition in, in Grasshopper was, uh, we have some, uh, some initial words here uh, that we're gonna use as the vocabulary. Uh, we also have a list that says the order of rules that are gonna apply. This, this order of rules is very important because uh, how, how can this thing be, how can it be worked? How can you synchronize the rules with the shapes? This is the main thing that makes uh, the, mechan the whole mechanism work. And then we have uh, a section that is where are the whole rules. Um, the students that we had during the workshop were not exactly all the same level of expertise. 
uh, and not many of them would know very well uh, how to code in Grasshopper. Uh, so we needed to make it as simple as possible, uh, mostly transparent. Just show them, hey, this is how it works. We click here, click, click there, and then play, and it works, it will run. So we developed this box uh, that, could, uh, that was the responsible for applying the rules. So we take the first shape, the second shape, and this is the shape that came from uh, the natural flow of the program, and then it will give you back uh, the shape uh, transformed or replaced or things like that. And this is inside that code. Uh, we made it so that it takes the geometry and the first geometry and the second geometry compares one of the other, all the relations, the scaling of rotation and things like that. And then comes the real input from the flow of the program and it applies the same transformation and gives it back. Uh, this is important because then we could use uh, uh, as well as uh, some drawing made in the Reno interface, or you can do, use it by making a definition in Grasshopper. It would be okay to use either, and then be free for how, uh, how much uh, knowledge the student have from, that, um, from Grasshopper. So, um, the teams were, we, I got two, two teams to work with Grasshopper. And uh, it was always a team of three, and some of the times we always had someone that was a teacher or a, gradu a graduate student and were very uh, acquainted with Grasshopper, and some other two that were beginners. So they could help up uh, one or the other and have sure and make sure that uh, some work would come up and not uh, spend much of our time doing the coding for the teams. So the first team uh, decided to uh, explore it in a more free manner, the shape grammar, and they decided to uh, get some music as an input, and that would change uh, how a facade would look like of this building. And it was very interesting because it was a replacement uh, rule, but uh, was it a shape or not a shape? And this was one of very interesting questions. So uh, the next uh, team, uh, they were a little bit more pragmatic. They wanted to have uh, some form uh, more specific, a shelter. And they started to do some experimentations uh, on how, uh, which set of rules and uh, what sequence we could get uh, to a shape that would make some sense, as I say. Uh, and uh, it was very nice to see the different approaches and the different questions that they brought up. And this is the part that I think that is more interesting about what we had there. Um, the, the objective of the, the workshop was to see how would that work and which are the limits and probably raise more questions and who knows, some answers at a point about the nature of what we're working with. So uh, anyway, before I get to those questions, um, it was interesting to say that uh, the code did work very well the teams used it for a while, and they decided, no, I will do my own implementation of this structure. And they started to see, to, uh, to try to develop how to make this uh, transformation and how to make this concatenation of the, the sequence of rules. Um, but even, even though uh, it was very easy to use, uh, there were some problems. Um, we didn't get to have the code recognizing the shapes, and it couldn't uh, also, of course, then, uh, recognize an emergent shape. Uh, it wasn't exactly uh, a very problematic question, uh, because uh, it, was, it were very uh, simple exercises that we made. And anyway, um, 
But then we, 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 we saw, okay, for, for the uh, future work, maybe we could go and solve this problem and the other one. And the thing is, uh, the part of uh, uh, emergence recognition of the shape, they, would be, they could be uh, emulated inside the rules, not exactly as having a mechanism to search for a new, new shape, but uh, we are coding it, so we know what kind of shape will appear after that procedure. So we can already, already tell, okay, after this procedure, they're gonna hap happen a, a new shape. And that's okay, it's a little bit fake, but it works better than it's working right now. And, uh, the, and it could, if we move this part to uh, the selection of the rules, instead of having a sequence of rules that I say, go like apply, apply the rule one, then the rule one again, then the rule three, then the rule four, uh, I can have a mechanism that uh, is based on which, uh, which is the shape that is resultant from the, from the earlier stage. So this first uh, transformation built a triangle. Then which are the rules that can use triangles? And then goes to that next rule, and we produce a circle. And which is the rule that works with a circle, and then you go to that. So the sequence uh, of the grammar uh, could be done, organized by this kind of, uh, by the sequence of shapes produced. Well, anyway. And the, the most interesting then when we got uh, the, the ideas that we, we got after that is this uh, derivation mechanism of the grammars, they are much of the time very left to the side, Not, never talked about to say, uh, here are the rules, here are the shapes, and then they just draw on the bottom the sequence that is applied, but that never, never explains how this mechanism works, but it's, uh, especially fundamental for uh, the working of the grammar. Depending on the sequence that you build, the result won't make any sense. So how can we be sure that uh, it will work fine? And which are uh, the criteria that you use to select from one rule to the other and be sure that the end will be something meaningful? Uh, this is the first thing. Um, of course, uh, there is the other problem that is uh, about uh, the randomness that is always uh, very addressed when we talk about uh, programming uh, shapes. Um, I just use a random sequence of rules and then need to build uh, an object that is important to me. We, we, what are the moments that I can use this randomness? Of course, if I just start playing around with the shapes, uh, the final result will be a complete mess that won't make any sense at all. So I have to have some order for it, which doesn't exactly uh, expel randomness from our process. Uh, and I understand that what we could do is, I can go with this precise sequence up to this point. In here, I can make a decision and have three or four or 10 or 100 options that go to another direction and then to this other node that I can have another directions. And then uh, the randomness would be to choose from different paths of those trees. <coughs> it's, uh, it gets then to another later questions. I think I lost a little bit of the order then, but I will get that to this. Uh, the other question that is, uh, interesting is, which are the limits of the shapes that we work with shape grammars? It's just lines, just uh, simple shapes. But uh, when they look like a, the Palladian grammar, they, they come from simple parallel lines, and then they switch it to a very much complex shape that represents a, a whole uh, section of a wall. So what are the, what are the limits of this? <coughs> And it comes from the first group that was talking about music. Uh, because if I come from two parallel lines 
and switch it to a representation, a section of a wall, almost a symbolic representation again, why can I come from a, a letter that's C that represents a note, a musical note, and, uh, and exchange it, replace it directly for a full uh, design of a fa facade or for a full design of a house? Which are the limits of those transformations that are allowed? <coughs> and if so, can I just replace the shapes for symbols and then work it with uh, like a, a symbolic grammars, for instance? And this is a, a question that I think is very interesting to, to, to debate. And uh, going back to the idea of uh, making a decision tree, and this is the problem that was posed by the second uh, group is, it's very troublesome to do uh, design using shape grammar that uh, really guess makes sense. If I just do the traditional way, won't it be uh, faster and maybe with a better quality? And uh, it, gets, it got us thinking a lot. Uh, and the idea that maybe I think that can conciliate better is like this. If I just do a once in a time project, I would do just this house or just this glass or just this bottle. If I just draw it, maybe it's quicker than if I do it with a, a shape grammar. But when I finish my project as a shape grammar, uh, the multitude of elements uh, of, of instances that I can build with those with that system that I built. Uh, the next time that I do a, a, a bottle or a house, instead of having or taking six months to make this project, I'll take uh, six seconds, and maybe uh, because the code is already done, you just have to run and play the dice for the randomness, and then have a different example of the same object for me. And then maybe it's a place where we could use better uh, the idea for a, a, gen, uh, a generative system uh, to cut the time of uh, doing a project. Not the first one, but when we start to doing many with the same system. And that's it, thank you. Um, it's about the um, link between um, ontologies and shape grammars. And um, I mean, I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to be critical about it. I think it's, you know, it's really important and it's very good. But in your um, examples where you're, um, you're showing the ontologies mostly in relationship to the um, geometry. And it seems to me that you know, replacing the geometrical description with an ontological description of this, you know, the same information isn't really, you know, moving very much ahead. I mean, this is the things we can already do. So I was wondering where in um, your examples does the, the value of the um, ontology really comes true where is, you know, can you, where is it that the ontologies allow you to do more than what we could be done with, you know, a geometrical shape grammar? In a way, it, uh, it looks like um, the ontology is basically replacing or, or, or complementing uh, what would be a description. Like it, it, could be, it could be seen like that. Uh, the way I see it, uh, but again, I, I, this requires further testing and, uh, and uh, demonstration, is that the ontologies can go beyond descriptions and beyond representations in the sense that they, they convey meaning and uh, semantics. So uh, instead of just having a, a description tag associated, associated to a shape, uh, it can be related to other parts in the design system. So I'm not just saying, I'm looking at the one piece of the design system uh, that is uh, unre apparently unrelated to, to things, like it's, it's a tag. Now that, that tag means something and relates to other parts of the design. So when I operate upon it, 
uh, I'm affecting the remaining of the design, or it should be uh, reciprocal. Um, uh, another thing is that, uh, and again, I, I have not reached this step yet, this is basically speculative uh, until now, is that in theory, we can use the inference uh, mechanisms of, uh, of ontologies to uh, identify relations that are not specifically uh, set there. So I put a new part in the design that wasn't there previously, and I only give a few relationships. But then the ontology, through reasoning, can say, okay, that point belongs it's actually between these two of uh, the endpoints of the line, therefore, and it's in the mid-distance, so it's a middle point of that line. And if, if we set these uh, relationships, oh, new triangles emerge. So in a sense, with the, uh, in theory, with enough descriptions or with enough um, uh, support in the ontology, it should be able to uh, infer new geometries and new relationships there, and maybe even new meanings. So th this could be uh, a step forward in a, in a, um, in a shape grammar implementation. Right now, it's, <laughs> it's not the easiest thing to do in the sense it's, it's still hard-coded, so it's not very friendly. Uh, but hopefully, it will, it will get towards that and into a friendly way that uh, 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 the designer can do the easiest part, which is basically I, I create a shape and I relate it to others. And, and uh, then the back stage mechanism does the rest. It says, well, maybe this then creates uh, new shapes, or maybe this uh, means something else. Uh, Can I add something to that? Okay. Yeah, it's basically two points. Uh, first point is um, the, the idea of doing this work with the bottles actually came out of trying to simplify the, the problem we were tackling before, which was the generation of a, a, a street cross-section, which embedded a lot more, uh, more complex stuff uh, uh, about uh, the, 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 the city structure and, and, and uh, aspects of uh, composition of public space. Uh, so to, to, to start with that, with that problem would be a very complex approach. And we, are, we had already a, a, a student that developed a, a, a parametric model for bottles that were, was actually uh, designing bottles from a wine bottle to the Coca-Cola uh, bottle. But it had no semantics. It was a simple uh, uh, parametric code. Uh, so uh, <coughs> because we had this idea that with... Uh, uh, simple ge geometric rules, we could actually generate many, many bottles. The idea was, let's try to uh, connect this with ontologies and make them semantically valid somehow, because it's a simple uh, uh, system to tackle. And a good example would be, let's say you model a geometry of, uh, of a wine bottle, and because you have expli explicit uh, uh, relationships saying that certain types of geometry actually produce uh, 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 a specific type of wine bottle or for a specific type of wine even, uh, you could say that getting a certain kind of geometry, while well, this is a, a wine bottle and it's for this type of wine because the ontology infers that information from the geometry. And it is possible, in principle, to uh, codify that in this way. So it, it's more intelligent than it seems, because it's not just giving the geometry, it's giving information about the type of wine that the bo bottle is supposed to contain. And so it, it's, it, it's more than it's actually visually accessible. Uh, then, of course, the idea would be to go back to the uh, street cross-section, which has a lot more <coughs> issues related with it, the quality of the public space and how to measure the quality of the public space and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, actually the idea is to later on get back to the uh, 
to the street cross section and applying the same ideas. Uh, this time for um, for Daniel. Well, actually, I first wanted to make a comment. Um, I mean, I liked your, um, your reflections at the end, um, but I think that some of those questions actually already have some answers. And for example, when, if you're when you're talking about you know the symbolic, the, the you know the the well the shape versus the symbolic representation. I mean, if you're looking into uh, if you look into um, description grammars, or you know, even simp simplify it, uh, consider you know labeled elements, uh, labeled points. Those could be considered as symbolic for you know representing something, and this can be easily um, uh, integrated into um, a shape grammar. But my question is really about um, your um, parametric implementation, and um, what I didn't understand. Uh, was why you had this list of um, rules, um, I mean, references to rules that you then, you know, that specified in which order the rules would be applied. Because it seemed to me that in a grasshopper model, wouldn't you just have a series of nodes, each representing a rule application, that you just link the output from one rule application becomes the input of a rule, another rule application? Didn't, wouldn't that seem a more logical? I mean, maybe you had a specific uh, reason for doing that. I'd, I'd like to um, hear about that. Yeah, uh, um, the, the first part of the question, uh, yeah, I believe that uh, when you start using uh, some markers and colors and lines and spots like that, uh, you begin to work with the symbolic. But uh, it was, uh, it's a totally strange and, and hard debate there. Okay, this is allowed, this is not allowed, off the rules. If we lose in the rules, okay, then no problem to, to work the semantic. But then, okay, I, I can, can play a, a, a chord in a guitar and translate it in the shape, no problem. <laughs> I'm okay with that. It's just a question of a, a strict definition. So, but uh, no problem with that. Uh, the, other, the other thing about having a list is um, then every time that I do a different rule, a uh, different sequence, I'll have to rebuild the whole code. In that, that form, no, it is not, uh, I don't have that. I, in one set, I put the shapes. In the other set, I, I code the rules or use those blocks and repeat them. And uh, then I have a selector that uses that first list, that is the sequence that says to use this rule and this one, not this one, this one again, and that's the selector. So I don't have to rebuild the whole definition. And if I add a new rule, I just copy that block, draw the new, uh, the new objects, and it's already done. And I can change that sequence freely without having to rebuild my whole code. Shape grammars and any grammar in a language can create very silly things. Chomsky said that about any any language. Portuguese, I, I may pronounce a, a sentence in Portuguese that's absolutely silly thing, and it's semantics that uh, uh, take care of the sentence is not a silly thing, and uh, I think it's ontology that can. Uh, bring that uh, semantic, uh, uh, static semantics that uh, uh, allows that the, the syntax does not create uh, many objects that uh, has no meaning at all. Uh, and I, I stressed many times here <laughs> that not only the, well, the internal semantics or connotational semantics, but also the the meaning, or, or that is to say, the external semantics, what the language relates with the, the reality. The, the notational semantics is also very important here. The translation between the internal language and the, what is outside the language is very important here. And uh, I think this answers your first question also, is what is introduced by ontology? Ontology creates uh, or uh, uh, describes the the semantics that uh, in the uh, in our studies uh, has nothing to say uh, to see with the shape, and that can orient, 
can uh, drive the, the research of the possible sentence to what it's uh, meaningful. 